Um, welcome everybody to, uh, is it, this is the, the well, one, two, three, the third night of the poetry reading series for ASL 2020 uh, virtual. Um, uh, if uh, anybody's been in any of the other sessions, I've given the explanation that um, the, the original plan was for the ASL conference to be in Cairns and we were going to meet face to face at that point and there would have been the opportunity for a poetry reading in Cairns. But as we all know, things have changed and now we're all getting used to uh, this new uh, sort of environment for many of us, but it still enabled us to gather together in this way and to, uh, to listen to poetry uh, being read uh, in sometimes quite an intimate, uh, intimate sort of uh, situation in, in that we are face to face uh, with the poets doing the readings. Um, I would like to uh, thank the Copyright Agency for uh, sponsoring the poetry readings um, uh, for, for the conference, as well as sponsoring um, a number of the other uh, events that we've had throughout the conference. Um, uh, and really that's all for me. I want to fade into the background now uh, and pass over the proceedings to Susan, Susan Hawthorne, who will lead us through the readings for this evening. Uh, so welcome and thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional lands upon which all the poets this evening are reading to you from. Uh, Robin Rowland is on the Wadi Wadi land of the Dalawal in New South Wales. Liz Murphy and Melinda Bobbers are on Ngunnawal country in and around Canberra. Uh, Bernie Jansen is on Jaja Wurrung uh, land of the Kulin Nation. Patricia Sykes is also on the Kulin Nation land of the Bunwurrung and Woiwurrung peoples. And I'm reading on the Jiru land in far north Queensland. We respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their custodianship of the lands and waterways which have never been ceded. So you will probably all know that all the poets who are reading tonight have been published by Spinifex Press and it's really thrilling to be able to do this. Uh, we're going to begin with Robin. Uh, Robin Rowland has written 14 books, 11 of poetry. Two of her books are bilingual in English and Turkish, Under This Saffron Sun and This Intimate War, Gallipoli Chanakali 1915. And between these books, she published another one called Mosaics from the Map, which was published in Ireland. And before each poet, I will introduce them. Over to you, Robin, unmute. Unmuted here. Good. Time piece on. <laughs> so, so thank you, um, Roger, ASL, copyright, uh, wonderful people, and Susan for organising this and Spinifex for publishing me um, a number of times, which is wonderful. Um, I, this, this book I'm going to read from that uh, Spinifex brought out is a book called This Intimate War, Gallipoli Chanakali 1915, Ishli Dish Bir Savash, Gallipoli Chanakali 1915. The Turkish translations are by uh, Mehmet Ali Çelikal, my dear, dear friend and translator. Um, it was published originally, uh, sponsored financially by the municipality of Chanakale, uh, which I think is one of the indicators of the incredible um, forgiveness and uh, friendship that Turkey has um, extended to uh, peoples who invaded that country. Um, I have been going to Turkey since 2009 and have worked and taught there. I think one of the things that struck me in around about 2012 was my first experience of being the enemy. And uh, that, that was brought home to me in the Naval Museum in Chinakale. I, I started researching, doing a lot of work, uh, research work on that war. And the book presents stories and experiences from both the Turkish and the allied uh, forces and also their peoples. So munitions workers, mainly women, of course, um, munitions workers, soldiers, nurses, doctors, painters, artists, poets, composers, and families who were dramatically affected by this really hideous war. 
Um, the languages face each other in the book as the men faced uh, each other in the trenches. It begins with the defeat of the British Navy in the Battle of Chinakle, about which we, of course, learned nothing. It records all those experiences from, from those people all the way through, and it finishes on um, a friendship, a women's friendship, um, and an alternative meaning for the red poppy. But if you want to know that one, you have to read the book and get to the end because I don't have time to read it tonight. So <laughs> now I'm going to read um, the title poem, which is called Close. And uh, this, this poem comes about because of the experience of, and this is my book, which is wonderful spin effects cover. Um, the experience comes about because uh, the Turks asked for um, a stop, a stay in the war at uh, one point so they could bury the dead. They'd been 3,000 dead around them for three days around the trenches. <clears throat> and you can imagine what that was like. It's called Close and it has a, a quotation from Mehmet Akif Ersoy and his poem to the martyrs of Chinakale, who can dig a sepulchre great enough for you? History itself say I, cannot contain you. Close in every sense, air humid and heavy in March, freezing and snowbound in November, trenches stained red, oozing water, then flooding with bodies washed to the sea, but nothing to drink. I'm so dry. A sea once vivid blue, now claret red. It's crust of white in the wind, scarlet. No use when my body, lice ridden, can barely crawl for hunger, not swim. And the thirst, we can't drink it. Close, the enemy trenches, feet away, rattling bullets or worse, the steel. Upward lunge of a bayonet driven home, jugular spurt, no need for medics if they could be found. We throw notes over a sandbag that separates our ditches. One said, you are too weak to advance, too strong to retire, and we are the same. So what shall we do about it? I can smell his cigarette in the break as if we had rest periods to breathe. I can smell the squelchy corpses, our shared dead. Briefly, a white singlet on bayonet tip rises. Stepping out to look into our eyes, that's when we know them. Suddenly, smooth hands, voices, smiles. They are boys like us, young. After, we go back into our holes. It's harder now. Close up, I see him carrying his wounded enemy, lifting him gently, laying him down carefully for us to collect. And he will probably be shot returning and our soldier die anyway. And still he does it because bravery isn't to do with this, but with finding himself again in some small act, some care. Another note lands. If you don't surrender in 24 hours, we will. We have humour, at least. We can hear them laugh sometimes, weep others, call to us at night. We don't know the language, but we know song when we hear it, the sound of a joke. Their songs break your heart open. You can hear home in them. One of us far away from home, the other not close enough. Close is what I remember of my son, five, his smell, my wife leaning for bed, from bed for her slippers, her dark hair, a lost photo. Now I know him in the trenches best, his ribs thin like mine, his bandaged foot, that cough at night, the black sleepless shape of his death. We all know each other, both sides. We know our towns, our cities, our families. We share our breath here, sometimes our sad food, inedible bully beef, grapes, tomatoes, hard biscuits, fresh bread. They killed my friend, relieving himself at dawn, blew him to pieces, and he fell on us all like rain. Close. I love him now, my enemy. I know him like me. 
He can't understand the way of it, the charging out, the sure death, the way they tell us and we do it. I feel his tremble at the boom of cannon, the sniper's zip. He knows death is there for us, no other way. Line after line of us both sides, one defending the place he loves, the other knowing it. They don't want us killed. We'd all be lonely here. We have no boundaries anymore. We are killing ourselves in this intimate war. Um, the trenches were literally so close that our common, our, our experience now of social distance was about it. You know, it's almost inconceivable. And the poems are written so that if a Turkish people re person read it in Turkish or an English speaking person in English, they can both identify with those experiences. Um, and that goes thread through the whole book. So the last poem I read is one of the women's poems. Um, and it's, again, could be a Turkish woman, could be an Irish woman, could be an Australian woman. When he was young, once, she only knew his body when it was young, not this. He rode wild horses, tamed everything, everything. He prayed or not. He swept her into life. His urgency was for her alone, not some idea of history, some vision of a hero. Now this short year that seemed so long, and she did not know this body now, not this. Scarred, the leg gone, mind altered beyond his being able to speak of it except to say, we did things we had to do. She had been so hungry, no food. She had been so alone, everything changing, family dispersed, confusion, no one to underpin all that was familiar, known. She wanted him back, not this. She only knew his body as husband. She remembered the moustache they laughed about, her lace veil trailing, her hennaed hands in his, her happiness, certainty of a future. Never years passing like this. The place falling to dust, death lists, the fear of news, the understanding, everything had gone now that she knew. Everything changed. She didn't want this, not this. What country is this? Men full of strange energy they call war, they call necessary. She can see it in a trapped kind of way, that necessity. But every young man from her town, every station hand, every merchant in the market, every father who had seemed so old then, now him, old while young, she wanted him back, real as the rocks and the sand, lonely for the him she knew in her heart, in her very loins, not this. Thank you. Thank you. Unmute. Okay. <laughs> this is the first time I've chaired anything on uh, Zoom. So here we go. Um, our next reader is Liz Murphy. Um, Liz has published 13 books, eight of poetry. Among her titles are Two Lips Went Shopping, Walk the Wildly and She Bird. Uh, Liz is a former poetry editor at the Canberra Times and has worked in regional arts development, arts and publishing, and she blogs at uh, Poets Slant. Over to you, Liz. Thank you, Susan, and thanks, Roger. It's just really fabulous to be a part of this. Um, so reading from Two Lips Went Shopping, um, this collection, it uh, goes back a little while, but it's interesting to see that some of them are still um, but some of them are documentation of the times and some of the poems 
are um, timeless in a way I'd rather they weren't be. They were. Like this one. Color code. This is the shop where garments hang on racks and meticulously sized and color coded, where one sales assistant says, that woman is no 10 or 12, asks if she's checked her rear lately. And the first manager on a diet of steamed chicken says, you wouldn't have liked me before I lost weight. I was always looking at myself in the mirror, straightens her jumper yet again, smooths her brown skirt yet again, strains to see her wide hips, pulls a face at her reflection. This is the shop where finally I get to fix the fitting room curtains, balancing on a chair, replacing the small brass rings, not for customer privacy, but because the big boss is coming from head office. Where customers are refused access to toilets and one says, my son can just piss all over your floor then. Where an elderly woman asks about discounts and the new manager, crabby and of double income family status says, pensioners have enough handed to them without 10% from us. Later, her sprawling new home built on a reclaimed creek bed split its sides. And so did I laughing. Walls like white shirt linen turned to brown polyester flood mud. This is the shop where a senior assistant bent her head in fury when three women came in to browse. Eventually asks curtly, are you right dears? Turns to me and says, they were our servants when we lived in South Africa. Stirs at the backs of their black legs as they take their leave, her eyes narrow as darts, fingers fumbling with dress hangers and buttons and tables that have turned. This is the shop where I was employed because I smiled so much and soon find it hard to smile at all. I find working, thank you, I find working as a shop girl, which I did when I was very young for a long time, excru excruciatingly boring. Had I known that later on I was going to be writing poetry and that I would have got poems from the experience, I would have been a lot happier, I tell you. <laughs> so using shops, the shop situation as a platform. I wrote this poem after um, a visit to Canberra by the then president of, president of Ireland, Mary, Mary McAleese. And um, uh, because of the timing of her visit, she could not uh, avoid, she had to talk about the infamous, infam sorry, oop, <laughs> the infamous OMA bombing, which happened in 1998. The weight of tomatoes. It's a late opening supermarket with bright lighting, quiet floors, wide white freezers, rows and rows of European foods and fishes, labels in foreign tongues, jars of preserves, legumes and brine, small ripe bulbs and colored juices. We are on the way home from talks of peace, pictures of war. We carry images of dead children, smoking bodies, blood like a growing beetroot stain. Seek solace in soft green avocados, choose rose red tomatoes. A young guy in a jacket, scarlet as tomato skin, prints out weight and price on red and white stickers. You're not your usual self, we say. Edges crumple as he smooths tacky paper around one firm fruit folds his arms, tells us yesterday his best friend died, shares the details. He remembers the things they did, the good times they had. While he's working, he says, he doesn't think about it so much. We offer condolences, feel the weight of ripe tomatoes heavy in our hands. Everyone has a story. And look, with a little mention of um, the Irish thing, 
that leads me into my other Spinifex Press book, and I remain. It, and I'm sorry, I haven't got the mirror thing. I'm not as clever as Robin Rowland, <laughs> who is featured in the book. We girls, women writing from an Irish perspective, with women from uh, Australia and Ireland and another four countries. Um, and uh, this is this was just a great experience, um, both with Spinifex as a publisher. Sorry if I lose my computer. I'm balancing on a tissue on a tissue box on my lap. <laughs> so there is a better view than when I first came on. Still slightly flustered. <laughs> Um, and I'd like to read um, one of the smaller poems by Ivan Boland as a tribute. And as many of you will know, um, Ivan Boland tragically died this year and um, still in shock. Just wonderful poet, just a wonderful poet. The Emigrant Irish. Like oil lamps, we put them out the back of our houses, of our minds. We had lights better than, newer than, and then a time came, this time, and now we need them, their dread makeshift example. They would have thrived on our necessities. What they survived, we could not even live. By their lights, now it is time to imagine how they stood there, what they stood with, that their possessions may become our power, cardboard, iron. Their hardships nestled in them, patience, fortitude, long suffering in the bruise colored dusk of the new world, and all the old songs and nothing to lose. And when I read um, that poem, I think not only of the Irish experience, um, migrants in general, and in particular asylum seekers today. And just one more small poem, back to Two Lips Went Shopping. When I told people I was writing this sh shopping poetry project, people shared their stories, which was unexpected and a lot of fun. And um, I should mention to the Canberra government who gave me an ACT Creative Arts Fellowship to do this book. Right, right, but go shopping, write poems, right. Thank you Vivian, to Vivian for this poem. Brian Hills. On a Brian Hill, a mother with low income and lackadaisy husband stands with her two thin girls, gawk-eyed at the window of their home, as the large department store blazes, flames casting strange light across the city. Raised to the ground, the building, the merchandise, the laybys, the records, and in the fire, the mother's account. All her white goods, the fridge, the freezer, a twin tub washing machine, another seven years of slow scraping debt. An honest woman, she died ashamed that she never wrote and told them how much she owed them. Thank you all so much. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, Melinda Bobbis is our next reader. She has published a third... Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong uh, bio. Um, she's a novelist and poet, and her most recent poetry collection, uh, Accidents of Composition, was highly commended in the 2008 ACT Book of the Year. And her novel, Locust Girl, won the 2016 Christina Stead for Fiction and the Philippine National Book Award. Thank you, Melinda. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Roger, for, for this. And thanks, Susan, for organizing this. I thought I, I was just going to read two very short poems, but I thought, you know, in the spirit of what we're going through, I'd like to start with a chant. Uh, from my um, the, the 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 epic poem that I used to perform and dance, Cantata of the Warrior Woman, the Ragamagayon. I think this little chant is fitting at this time of COVID nineteen. Ibinabalik ng lang i i ang yung mga matang sinlinaw ng buwan. Ibinabalik ng lupa ang yung mga susong na hitik 
ilabing hitik sa salita, ibinabalik ng dagat ng iyong mga susong naudan ng latay, ng latay. Sky gives you back your eyes, splinterless as the moon. Earth gives you back your lips to fruit with words. Sea gives you back your breasts without the wells. Gives you back, gives you back. And I think this is a fitting start in the midst of what we're going through. So I am reading two poems, short poems, from my latest poetry book, Accidents of Composition. And the first poem is The Story of Blue, and it has this epigraph. Brought to China from Iran, cobalt was called hooking, Muslim blue. And that's from East Asia, A New History by Hugh Dyson Walker. She circumnavigates the rim of the cup with a finger, once for worry, twice for deep thought. Now it's six times under water in the sink, but pausing on a chip, only her seasoned finger knows. A world, wounded six times over, she sighs. Tracing the Chinese pagoda, still as blue as the willow swaying in that breeze, she swears she feels when she sips her tea. It's the only cup left of great-grandmother's willow pattern set sent home to London two decades after the family's tint with the East India Company. Too much breaking through the years, but always there was tea. Through the opium wars, five cups out of six. The Indian Rebellion, four cups. Then the First World War in England, two. Later wrapped in grandmother's wedding dress, sailed all the way to Sydney. White and blue, as blue as the sky her mother used to tell her. A blue to die for, as her brother did on the Kokoda track. Again she hears how it shattered at her mother's feet when the letter came. So, this orphan cup. Again she pauses on the chip that only her finger knows. Only a tiny pin it was, cup against the tap after her guest had left. After he had asked, who's blue, who's sky, who's orphanhood? How dare he shatter their history? Five cups, then four, then two, then one. But only a tiny ping of anger it was at this sink. One can't be precious about breakage these days. TV news is infested with it and the shards we sweep under the carpet to survive. But she remembers the blue bit that cut her hand when she helped her mother clean up after. A bit of that willow swaying the breeze as if it were a balmy spring day. She's never seen so much red on the white tea towel. So, how dare he ask her about the other colors? This son of hers come home from another war in the East, eyes bloodshot and speaking in tongues. That blue is not English or Chinese, Mum. It's Muslim blue. Don't you know that? And the story is not always about us. She circumnavigates the rim of the cup with a finger. The sixth spin longing to round her world, wounded by the wound of her own blood. In this time of COVID-19, I hope we keep remembering that the story is not only about us. This losing, grieving, and surviving, and hopefully the resources that help us co-survive must be shared. After all, as my other poem proposes, 
love is planetary. From the first urge, no, from the inkling of an urge, perhaps way before time, before the Big Bang, when black holes, matter and antimatter and space were yet light years unknown to each other. This is the astronomy of our chance to meet, even with the most strange, most distant, and evolve by accident something even stranger, a ringed planet, a newborn star, or this thing called Earth. So, sweetheart, from the other side of the globe, ocean, river, field, mountain, wall, barbed wire, or the border of tanks and guns, faceless yet to each other. There is hope for us. And I'd like to say that again, in these times of a crisis that we are sharing and we are co-surviving, there is and there must be hope for all of us. Marami marami salamat. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Melinda. Now, I noticed that Bernie has dropped out, so her um, connection must have fallen out. So, um, Patricia, if we can move on to you until Bernie, we hope we'll find her way back. Thank you. Put your... Unmute. Unmute. How's that? That's great. <laughs> Um, I'm going to begin with a poem from Wire Dancing, my first collection with Spinifix, which is where I met Susan. We joined the same year. Uh, I was 50 and I became utterly obsessed with the skill of tightrope walking. And this is a photo from the very first season of the Women's Circus. The poem's called Performing the Belly, and it begins with an inscription from Haxby's Circus by Catherine Susanna Pritchard. It also references Balbo, the bawdy goddess, who was the one who told Demeter to stop whinging and wailing and get up off her tail and do something about getting her daughter Persephone back into the world for at least six months each year. But that's not the topic of the poem, just to confuse you. Performing the belly. All you gotta do if you want to make the crowd laugh is stick out your belly and shake your backside at it. The winter of politics, the need of a good laugh. All those cold privatizations of heat, water, light. Life by the grace of capital. So shake your backside at the privateers. They've been rehearsing takeovers long enough to have worked up to humour. It's better to be obscene than depressed, to use the belly over rhetoric. Dice entre las piernas, says the Spanish. She speaks from between the legs, pissing on politics. The genitals of humour alive under the skirt. Cut to Balbo, out on the crossroads, giving Zeus the finger, making her audience laugh. Fire in the belly, rubies in the navel, hot coals, hot comedy, snow job seasons, how they work the flesh.
The second poem I want to read is from my second collection, Modawari, Home Ground. Modawari is the Wadarong word for the musk duck. Um, it's also part of the Kulin Nation. It's an exploration of colonialism, um, invasion of indigenous culture and land and the loss of same, and also refugee, the situation with refugees. It's where I was, we were living when my mother died. I was nine, so it's very much about home, belonging and loss. Vocal Geology One. This the year I thought to have found it, and have not. Who would begin at the heart? Who at the ear, the tongue? Ants come to forage and carry off nothing. It behaves like a river, sluicing off each leaf, each finger clinging. Yesterday it dislodged a breast, today an eye. It drinks no milk and is blind. Yet still it lies here listening to voices of unbearable sentiment, singing of O oh, home of the dream I lost. Tomorrow more will come trying to touch its eyes with their own. What can it say that is not already said? Be at peace in your mouth. Accept that it has no voice, that it has lain here infinitely to promote no proof. Flowers keep appearing at the boundary I named it once after one of the dead. This the year I thought to have found it and have not. And finally to my third collection, The Abbotsford Mysteries based on the Good Shepherd Convent in Abbotsford in Melbourne. This is where my sisters and I ended up in the orphanage after the death of our mother at Modawari. I interviewed 70 ex-residents of the convent who'd been there between the years 1927 and when it closed as a Catholic institution in 1975. And I've woven their anecdotes through the entire collection. So many of the poems include multiple voices, as does this one. Each phantom ache an amputee. In the whisper trenches, we count parents siblings, the way you ordered fingers and toes. Like confetti, you're all scattered everywhere. The museum of the lost a camouflage of files, a shuffler of mingled dusts. I was determined never to marry an Australian in case I married my brother. Skin memories, lifetime touch. Who can cut you as utterly as the one who holds the sword? Our guardian was a mongrel, he split us up. The razor of power having such adult force. In a time of apologies, the authorities aghast and the era that meant it for the best put to bed as history. 
nothing will ever be as bad. Day, night, the seasons, the search. Each year on her birthday, the ex-ward of state who advertises in periodicals of hope is unable yet to strew rose petals for a mother unearthed. I asked my father, you didn't kill her, did you? I might have, he said. The collection was um, adapted to a song cycle last year by Melbourne composer Andrew Aronowitz and it was performed, sung by Leanne Keegan and performed by the Plexus Ensemble. And there's a podcast forthcoming that will be freely available, I believe, um, to all visitors to the Abbotsford Convent. But like a lot of things under the COVID shutdown, it's running behind time. So I just want to finish with a very quick Gloria poem from the collection. It's structured around the, um, the Catholic rosary beads. Gloria, Kyrie eleison, our voices shiver above the narthex. If we could dance, our blood would warm us. Lord, oh Lord, wear high vijide girls, rock and roll girls. We keep your picture next to Elvis. Kyrie eleison. Thank you. Um, Trish, I'm so sorry, I, in my panic when Bernie disappeared <laughs> off the screen, um, I didn't introduce you. So I'm just going to, you've done some of it for me. But uh, what you didn't say was that, um, that you're a, well, when we know you're a poet, but also a librettist, and that you've worked with Lisa Lim for performances uh, in the UK, Germany, Moscow, Paris, New York, and Australia. Uh, and uh, it's amazing, amazing work. So thank you, um, Bernie. Uh, because you disappeared, we went straight <laughs> to Trish. So I hope, <laughs> hope you can stay. <laughs> um, now, uh, Bernie Jansen is a sound poet and poetry maker, maker in the sense of the Greek word poien. Uh, she works as a text artist, performer, creative director, a facilitator of cross arts forms, and her most recent book is Between Wind and Water in a Vulnerable Place. Yes. That's it. That's it. That's the one. So, oops. Um, I'm reading from Between Wind and Water, and I'm reading Vera. With the years passing, each a year of growing, eating and returning to the soil, the soil deepens. Rich and thoughtful worms, tunnelling air, turning. Each year, the harvest, fresh in summer, the sweet smells hover with bees. Linger in the kitchen, Add to the calm night's warm joy. The garden is giving and Vera is giving. She tends the garden, digs the soil, composts, mulches, harvests, cooks, preserves. A life begun, origin, spun in a village. Stone homes, crag top, her family, Root clung centuries, a world away in time and thought. Speranza Sempre. Her living is with the earth, all her living with the earth. Hands know the heat, texture, till. The soil 
is tendered, deep, full with basil, broccolini, sweet corn, cos, peas. Hand skin, hard crust, crack, no tender. In the roll of dough, the play of palms, clapped, clipped, held. When small uncurls, Speranza sempre, spill the water warm on so soft, a tininess exhales. The voice grows tall and the days tough end in a murmur. They are planted, the children, seed grown strong, and they on the wind away journey blown some. She is still stay. In the day to day of it all, in the house on a hill, a home away. Here, in the garden, talk shared neighbourly from year to year, baskets bounty balanced born. Amica, afternoon spread, binds, lives on land, a sun up, a sun down, stories similar and sounding. They are together in the paddock sprawl, country mile, solitary. There, when needed, the familiarity of female, not as in soul secrets, but as necessity that turns differences to comfort. And the small of every day, sticky as jam. With the years, they are to each other kind. And now the kindness of others has been spliced by greed. They heed each other's worn and bleary, thump, awake, fright, scuttle, sleep, the dreams torn. Tatter night of shattered sleep. They fear fold, huddle in shared. Stories of what the night holds on wind drone, ice clear nights, the pipe. And in speaking together, know the other speaking true. As they too speak true of what they in the home, heart, place of rest, of soul to soul, open, bare, where dreams migrate. In this place where truth is all, this disrupted, invaded Speranza Sempre, they know that to speak abroad of what they know will not be believed. They know the isolation of their speaking. They know their bodies pulse, quiver and twitch. The pressure and pain in ears, head, chest, all tightening. They know this as what has happened and still happens from day to day, night to night, not every day, not every night but never before the turbines operated, never before. All spoken over afternoon tea. Speranza sempre. This where down, pound, scattering, sleep, the day, thought, and no where, when, standing, before the cupboard seeking what? Swaying, grasping, formica, bench top, snow dome, fleck, tossed, blurring in this topsy turvy world, belief in a government that protects its people, shattered. Knowledge of big business, uncaring ways, compound. Profit before people, not 
the world she knows. Not the world of baskets filled and shared, of doing to their neighbour as they would have done to themselves, of honesty, compassion in all. This incomprehensible in the round upon round of plea and complaint to counsellors, politicians, the company, year in, year out, warn. Warning, as she empties shelves, drawers, cupboards of her breath, her smell, her hope, that she will not surrender will return home, not let others live like this, emptying into suitcases, boxes, bags, their lives of small things, moments, memories. Not much in the end, when the door closed, locked, the gate shut, locked, the house growing cold in the brisk southerly. Speranza Sempre. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bernie. Okay, uh, it's over to me now. I have to introduce myself. Um, I've authored 16 books and I'm a poet and novelist and I'm also the publisher at Spinifex Press along with Renata Klein. Uh, my collection, Cal, was shortlisted for the 2012 Kenneth Slesser Poetry Prize and my two most recent books are Dark Matters, which is a novel, and a collection of poetry called The Sacking of the Muses. Um, I'm going to begin with um, a poem from my first collection, uh, which is called Bird. And the poem uh, is The Language in My Tongue. This is the cover of the book. Um, my tongue has blossomed in my mouth. It is filled with language. It spreads like a big red balloon with language caught inside. A language that can't distinguish one thing from another. A language that does not care for past or future. A language tense with the present. The language in my tongue dissolves all history. It dissolves all expectation of the future. The language in my tongue is a big red balloon. There's a language in my body too. A language in the arch of my back a language in the froth from my mouth, a language in my clenched fist, a language in the cry from my lungs. There's a language in my bleeding tongue. The language in my body and in my tongue is the language they spoke in Delphi, the language of the seizure that dispels time, that defies death, that returns the orator to the world of light, that single point that draws me back from the inertia, the gravity field of a whole so black, nothing exists and nothing matters. Um, and the other poems I'm reading are from my new book, which is The Sacking of the Muses, and I'm not as clever as Robin with mirror <laughs> picture. Um, this one is called Patriarchal Grammar. A way of knowing that all you know is all there is to know. A way of speaking so that everyone else knows to remain silent. A way of being that lets you walk through life oblivious to the pain of others. A way of making asymmetric war against the powerless. A way of using your body as a weapon and then calling it love. And today when I was reading that, I thought of Dyson Hayden and many others. Um, the, the rest of the poems, uh, or no, three, uh, three poems are from the sequence called 
the sacking of the muses. And it's in sort of two half voices. One is the voices of the muses uh, and the other is a more contemporary take on them. So this one is Malpamini, Muse of Tragedy. In your boots, you stomp around the stage with your knife, your club and that hideous mask. Life is tragic enough without making it ugly too. Your sting is like that of the bee whose honey is sweet, but the bite can kill. That's how the tragic arts are. We are all engrossed in the story. Meanwhile, our lover has died of heartbreak or lost dreams or serial disappointments. We all think we're immune to a tragedy in our lives until it strikes without warning. Like a lightning flash, there is no way back. We are all changed by those moments when we had hoped for joy. Mel Pamini, sing your dirges for me so that I might haul myself up, unwrap the cloths, split the hard chrysalis, emerge transformed. These poems were written uh, in the days before, during and after the election of Donald Trump. It was also the same year when George Brandis decided that only the excellence in arts deserved funding. And this poem is called Muses Are Occupying. We move in under cover of darkness with our blankets for the night the sun hats for the day. We are occupying the upmarket end of town where star arts happen under the guise of excellence. The star arts receive funding every year. They drink cocktails, they appear on television screens. We look like a bunch of hobos. We've come a long way up from the dark caves where we've been meeting these last weeks so our rustic attire is intentional. We say we represent the arts at the edge of chaos, well beyond your horizon. In the darkest hour of the night, we begin our chant. We draw the spirit of rebellion to us. By morning, all that is left are a few leaves, some woven threads, butterfly wings and small red hearts. And the second last poem of the sequence is Muses Come Out of Hiding. We come out of the desert. We carry desert fruits. Animal friends accompany us. We are not in hiding. We have never hidden. It is you who could not see. And then the final poem I want to read is a poem called Schlesha. I've been learning Sanskrit for many years and Shlesha is one of the most wonderful things I've discovered in Sanskrit poetry. I mean, I didn't discover it, but you know, it's one of the things that exists. Um, in, it, it's a way of saying two sentences whose meanings can be completely distinct. Uh, so you, Sanskrit has all the words joined together and so you can cut the, the compound word in multiple ways and have them saying completely contradictory things, if you like. And the word shlesha means embrace. Shlesha, a way of writing two meanings at once, a way of reading with flexibility, a train going in two directions simultaneously. Schlesia comes naturally to lesbians. Our codes read this way, read this way and that. Are you on the upper bunk going east or the lower bunk going west? Like an MC Escher drawing, one hand draws the other, one hand makes love, the other answers. We embrace our double lives like actors and their alter egos. Some say Schlesia is unnatural. I've heard the same said about us. So thank you. Hey, we're only one minute over time. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody want to ask questions of the poets? If you do, unmute. <laughs> mm. Now you're all bowled over.
<laughs> well, any any poets want to say anything? Yes, if you'd like to buy our books, you go to the Spinifex <laughs> website. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Robin. Yes. No problem. <laughs> You'll find them all there, either under the titles or you can look up the, the poet's name and then you can find all the books. Um, so, yes, that's a very good point. And we will have a new catalogue out soon. And, in fact, in July sometime, we're going to have a brand new website, which is terrifying and wonderful. <laughs> And also, I hadn't realised that you, know, you can have these comments coming up. So um, I just think it's, it's, I've just gotten on to these bits at the bottom. And it's really lovely, everybody being so kind it's, it's, and enjoying the poetry so much. It's just mm -hmm. lovely. Th thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you to everyone. And uh, keep well and stay safe. Yeah, thank you. Ditto. <laughs> right. This is this is the moment where at the end of the poetry readings it's become customary in this situation for uh, the person who's sitting in the background to uh, unmute everybody and this is the moment where you can actually make some noise and applaud for the readers for tonight. So here we go. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Thank you. Quite Yay, thank you everybody. It was a wonderful reading. Really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really powerful night and I feel really proud of us all and enjoyed the company of everyone. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank to you everyone. Thank you, Liz, for sharing the link. I'm glad that I could make it. Oh, I'm <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Liz, thank for you. sharing the link thank because you. it was so wonderful. I'm so glad oh. you could join us. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, it's it's lovely. It's been lovely to hear all my mates read too. I mean, really, that's just lovely. It's God, it feels like it's so so long since I was at a really good reading. So it's been mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to everyone. Look, it's been great reading with you all and seeing you all. Um, and thanks for everybody who popped in to listen and all the comments. And thanks particularly to Susan and Roger for making this happen. It's been great fun. Um, really miss live poetry reading. So this has gone a long way to filling in a gap. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>